Right. Jokes and truth, I jot in the rhyme. Chicano house to all my two now. Do a song with y'all in his papa's house. A one eight two San Diego. Become a legend in the valley like Danny this Trejo. What I had to do. This is Valley View. This is what I had to do. This is Valley View. Can we sing it like eh, 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 Ah, yes, and a good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending when and where you're listening to Valley Views. I am your host, Hector, here, and of course, our co-host, Carlos. How are you? Good morning today. Hey, I'm good. Yeah. I'm, I'm excited right now. All right, all right. Well, you know, um, it's uh, you know, it's, it's one of the things about uh, Meet the Candidate series, and you know, we've done these uh, in the past as well. Is just uh, you know, really just to get a chance to know uh, individuals, right? Uh, Angelinos, uh, you know, folks that are part of our community and uh, what it is that they want to uh, try to contribute, you know, to yeah. our society in different roles that we have in government. Uh, you know, there's different levels to it. Uh, so, you know, we've been able to uh, interview a variety of folks that are uh, running, whether it's, uh, you know, federal, uh, state, uh, county, local, and, uh, you know, every single position, every single uh, part of our democracy, right, matters. And it's uh, important that um, our uh, audience uh, get to know as many candidates as possible in the uh, primary election and then of course later on uh in november in the general election as well so I'm, I'm glad carlos you're getting this experience as well as an intern co-host it's always uh great to see your growth as well and uh with that said we just want to uh as we uh, continue our meet the candidates 2022 series here at kroj uh we just want to definitely remind you that valley views and kroj uh do, do not endorse any political candidates or campaigns we really just uh our goal our vision here is really to educate our audience and let the candidates speak for themselves you know and with that said i think uh, we're ready to introduce our uh candidate here uh we're talking about marina torres uh who is running for los angeles city uh attorney's office first of all good morning marina how are you this morning good morning good morning i'm doing well thank you thank you for having me on the show yes uh it's uh it's a pleasure to have you here and uh, we're excited to uh, get to know you and your platform your campaign your vision and uh yeah like what you hope to achieve uh, as a LA city attorney. Um, and with that said, we'll, we'll go ahead and, uh, start with, uh, uh, Carlos. Go ahead, Carlos. And I wanted to ask, um, what made you want to this, um, like what made you decide to run for office? Well, I'll start kind of from the beginning. Um, you know, my, my family came over from Mexico, from Michoacan and Jalisco, and they came over and documented. And so for the majority of my childhood, it, you know, immigration was a real concern. I mean, it, we lived, we lived, I mean, we were incredibly poor. Um, but in addition to that, we were always worried about, you know, fa some family member getting deported. Um, but through a lot of, you know, luck and determination and a lot of hard work, a lot, a lot of hard work, I got to Berkeley for undergrad and then Stanford for law school. Um, I was in the private sector for a while. I got to work for President Obama on DACA policy, which was amazing, as you can imagine. And um, I'll get into it a little bit more as you know the show goes on. But I eventually became a federal prosecutor, which is what I recently did. And in that position, I was going after international drug cartels, money launderers, fraudsters. I mean, I used to do sex offense cases as well, domestic violence cases, and. You know, I think one of the the common themes in my you know career of twenty some years is that I, it's a passion of mine to fight for those who can't fight for themselves, uh, those who just have no voice in government. And running for city attorney for me is a continuation of that. It's a continuation of being a prosecutor because that you can imagine there's so few women, so few Latinas. It, it, lawyers, period, right? I mean, I think we're about to have uh, a Latina uh, justice on the California Supreme yeah. Court. I think she's yeah. getting sworn in next week. Uh, but it's 2022, right? And yeah. and uh, but it's it's incredibly important that we have you know some representation. And for city attorney, I will share with you guys and your viewers: there's never been a woman city attorney. There's never been a Latina city attorney in the entire history of Los Angeles. Uh, so for me, it's both about trying to break more glass ceilings for people, you know, like my niece. My niece is four, and 
I want her to grow up in a world where this is not, we're not talking about first anymore, right? It's like, of course I'm going to be a judge. Of course, yeah. you know, I'm going to be a politician and, and do good for people. So for me, running for city attorney is a continuation of being a prosecutor and fighting for people. And it's something that I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed. Uh, it's been the honor of a lifetime to be, do th to be able to do that. And, and I hope next step is to be city attorney. Yeah, and uh, and speaking of that too, um, can you tell us a li little bit for our audience? Uh, because uh, you know it, it's a role that uh, sometimes uh, you know you hear about other representative offices, mm -hmm. um, but as far as like the city attorney's office, can you describe a little bit for the uh, for our audience just that role? Like you know on a you know a day to day basis, like what is the city attorney's office role uh, in in obviously our city, but also just everyday. Uh, you know, functions. Sure. There's three formalized roles and there's kind of a fourth fuzzy one that I like to talk about. So um, obviously there's the DA, the district attorney who does the uh, countywide federal, uh, sorry, countywide felonies um, and some misdemeanors. The city attorney's office for LA does the local city of LA misdemeanors. So that's, that's kind of the extent of what they do on the, uh, on the criminal side. On the civil side, the city attorney sues on behalf of the citizens of Los Angeles. So say there's um, a massive oil spill, right? Like it would be the city attorney who sues on behalf of the residents of that neighborhood, you know, and tries to get them justice, tries to get them, you know, money to, to buy new homes and move out of the area, things like that. And then the third, um, which the third responsibility, which is really important, is advising the city council's office on pieces of uh, legislation and ordinances that they may want to pass. And the fourth thing that I said, um, you know, again, it's not really a formalized role, but it's it's really the public role of being a city attorney, right? There's a lot of things that the city attorney can do. I mean, I, uh, I'm i sure we'll talk about homelessness, but for example, there are some state uh, laws right now that govern civil commitments. You know, the city attorney can't do anything, right? Because it's not a state legislator, but I can talk about it. I can talk about how important it is that we address that and how important it is if we're going to really solve a homelessness issue. So I call it like the bully pulpit. Mm -hmm. And it really takes a, a city attorney that's comfortable going to different neighborhoods, going to different podcasts, yeah. um, and is going to be connecting with people, right? It's the face of the office. And I think that's a really important, even if it's not formalized, role uh, of the city attorney. Because it helps hold people accountable. Right? Absolutely, right. Yeah. That's a really good point. Because you're you're putting the fa your mm -hmm. face, you're attaching your face, your name yeah. to that office, you know? And you're like, like the buck stuff stops here. Yeah. Absolutely. And, 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 and let's get into that actually, you know, because some folks, uh, you know, we, we, we ourselves here have had different, uh, guests, uh, with different, you know, points of views when it comes to our unhoused neighbors, the homeless crisis. And, um, uh, you know, as, as city attorney, um, like looking at it through that lens, sometimes, you know, we, we've heard here in our communities, things like, for example, you know, the, um, criminalization of folks that are unhoused, um, and, you know, resources that we use such as, you know, LAPD, for example, with, uh, uh, uh sweeps and things of that sort. But what do you think as far as like your role, uh, in that city attorney's office working with, you know, the community law enforcement, um, and also just, uh, community organizations and whatnot to be able to, uh, you know, really, uh, tackle, this um, not just crisis, but really an emergency uh, when it comes to uh, housing in our unhoused neighbors. Yeah, I mean, and you said it correctly. I mean, it's an emergency. I, I really am shocked that fact that, that fact we haven't called it a state. We haven't called for a state of emergency. I mean, I I don't know where our electeds live. That this is not you know the first thing they see in the morning and the last thing that they see when they're leaving their jobs. But it's it's reached epic proportions. I mean, the and it's a tragedy for everybody. It's a public safety tragedy. It's a public health tragedy. There's literally people unhoused that are dying on the steps of City Hall. I mean, if not every day, nearly every day. Um, it's incredibly unsafe as well for the unhoused community. I, I was part of a takedown, it was about a year ago, um, where in my office, the U.S. Attorney's Office, we took down a criminal cartel that was operating in Skid Row. And we arrested about 50 people. I want to say, don't quote me, but I think it was like, Oh my God! Um, Eighty thousand pills of fentanyl were taken mm. off the street, and like fi over five hundred pounds of methamphetamine. Um, and what we were finding was that these criminal cartels were preying on the homeless. Right? They knew when the homeless individuals were going to be getting their SSI or their benefits. They knew the exact date, and so they'd hang around, right, mm. with their drugs and and keep them 
addicted, which then kept them homeless because they'd be resistant to services, resistant to mm-hmm. being convinced to get off the streets. Um, and in a lot of situations, they were also making the homeless individuals part of their cartel. I mean, whether they wanted to or not, mm-hmm. they charged them rent to put up their tents yeah. in certain spots. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, the part of the city attorney's office is enforcement, obviously, when yeah. it comes to, to the homeless problem. Um, and I think we can't ignore the criminal element. I think we can't ignore the mental health component. And we can't ignore the role that drug addiction plays in that. Um, housing is obviously, uh, of course, part of the solution, but I think that our elected leaders right now have failed because they've only been talking about housing, right? Mm-hmm. They too, yeah. and completely ignored everything else. And I think that's why, you know, we spent uh, Proposition HHH. I think we spent over a billion now has already been allocated, um, and it's not enough housing, right? Even when it's all built, and it's being built too slow. And now each unit, I think the average is like eight hundred thousand dollars per yeah. unit. Yeah. It's insane. That's incredibly expensive. It's you know, incre- for this and bond it's measure. Not, yeah, <laughs> yeah, and it's yeah. not going to solve the problem. Yeah, I mean, homelessness true. since that was passed, yeah. homelessness has actually gone up forty five percent. So the problem's getting worse, not better. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, and you know that's uh, uh, but but thank you for li- highlighting that as well. Just because you know there there is a role. You know, as far as like uh, city attorney's office as well, that sometimes, uh, you know, might not get as highlighted as, you know, other entities in our city as well that that are dealing with or trying to, you know, solve uh, this problem alongside, uh, you know, our community as well. And Carlos, uh, I I think you have a a question as well. Yeah. And as federal prosecutor, I wanted to ask you, what does the term justice for all mean to you? Yeah. So I started off my prosecutorial career working on domestic violence, misdemeanors, and child sex offense cases. And I will tell you, I mean, I and, and in the many, in the several years that I've been a prosecutor, I've, you know, it's it's gone up from misdemeanors to bigger cartel cases, bigger and more complicated financial um, fraud matters. But the cases that I started off with, those domestic violence and sex offense cases, still remain some of the hardest cases that I've ever had to prosecute. Um, because oftentimes our victims were repeat victims, right? They were um, sometimes undocumented women that didn't want to come forward. Sometimes they were sex workers, mm-hmm. right, who had a very difficult relationship with law enforcement, but now we're victims and, you know, we had to convince them that, you know, they could trust us and mm-hmm. that uh, th- they should testify against their abusers. So for me, that's an example of what justice for all is, right? It's fighting, again, for those that um, that can't fight for themselves, that have had a negative interaction mm-hmm. with law enforcement. Uh, I started off, I, I never thought I was going to be a prosecutor, let alone a federal prosecutor. I, uh, when, when um, I was in law school, my then 16-year-old brother was charged and then convicted as an adult, and he was given two strikes. And this mm-hmm. was back, this was over in San Bernardino County. Um, he was a first time offender. I mean, he was actually an honors and AP student. And this was a different time, you know, it, before kind of the conversation of, you know, of, of criminal justice reform. Mm-hmm. But that really, I mean, that, that was the beginning. I mean, that, that really changed how I viewed criminal justice mm-hmm. and the justice system and motivated me to be part of that, to go in and, you know, go after the people we should be going after. Because you know, it helped the, the, shape like that kind of perspective. Absolutely. And, and not, you know, not really spend our limited government resources on people we shouldn't. I mean, street vendors, I can't believe we're still citing street vendors, right? It, it, like, that's just such a bad use of our of our resources. Mm. Um, and yet, you know, crime is rampant. We've been seeing violent crime go up like crazy. I mean, yeah. I have friends concerned that they can't wear their jewelry or, you know, even walk outside and have a nice dinner without being another target. So, uh, you know, it, that's what justice for all means is going after the people that are preying on our, fa- on our family members, on our senior citizens, on our folks that are just trying to live their lives. Mm-hmm. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. And then what about, um, you know, just, uh, you know, more or less along the same lines there, but, you know, back in 2020 during the pandemic and really in the summer, you know, we had this, um, you know, racial justice um, reckoning, if you will. You know, we have uh, uh, all over the nation, you know, uh, Black Lives Matter uh, protesting uh, and calling for the defunding of, of police. Right. Um, and uh, from your role, you know, both as a federal prosecutor, attorney, like, um, you know, when you hear that, um, what goes through your thought process? Yeah, I've, I've always believed that we need better quality policing, not 
less police. I mean, I, I work with law enforcement day in and day out. My office also prosecutes bad officers, right? Um, and I can tell you, you know, good cops want to see bad cops out of the system because they give the they give the force a bad name. Bad rep. Um, yeah. Absolutely, I think we need to be putting much more resources into de-escalation training, right? Like um, more into mental health training as well, because right now our LAPD, our firefighters, our officers, they're the front lines. I mean, when some when you see a, an individual who's in a house who's having a mental health episode. You know, we call nine one one. They're the, on the front lines, and frankly, like I said before, I mean, they, we should be using them to go after cartel operations. We should be using them to, you know, get guns off the street. Mm -hmm. And instead, they're being called to um, to address what is a mental health crisis and situation. So, I believe we need more resources and be again, better quality policing, not less police. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Carlos, you want to ask the next, and then we have uh, yeah. we're, we're uh, got a couple more questions here for you. Go I ahead. wanted to ask, um, what's your plan on helping with um, law enforcement? I know we just mentioned that, but could you go more further into it? Sure. Um, and, you know, again, I, my, my personal experience is I can't divorce from what I would do. Um, obviously, there's been, uh, especially among communities of color, you know, growing up Latina with brothers, with loved ones, right? I mean, that I'll share, you know, I was one time <clears throat> in the car with my brother uh, in a mall parking lot. Right, mall parking, like mm -hmm. huge, right? There's no yeah. streets. And this cop pulled us over because my brother hadn't turned on a turn signal. And I was like, what? You know, and I'm, the, I'm sitting in the, there. In I'm the like, mall parking lot. Mall yeah. parking yeah. lot. <laughs> and I'm just sitting, you know, it's my brother who has a record, right? Yeah. But at that time, I think he was, uh, he's actually at the University of Alabama now. So, right almost, on. yeah, Shout he's out getting out. his law yes, degree. Yes, yes. Um, but I think at the time he was in college. Uh, but, you know, again, has a record that's mm -hmm. following him. And I'm next to him, a federal prosecutor. And I'm just thinking of like all the ways that this could go bad, mm. right? So it's a reality. Like that is a history that we cannot ignore and we have to confront and we're, we're still fixing, mm. right? We're still remedying. Um, but I think with more and more people in law enforcement, I think myself included, with that experience and with that mentality and working together, um, I think we can really do a lot of good, you know? But I, I've, I believe in a true partnership with our law enforcement officers. Like mm -hmm. I said before, I mean, the good cops are the first ones to tell you we want to get these bad cops out of the system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, and uh, what about what's your plan um, as far as um, you know in in that role as city attorney to support uh, you know whether it's uh, victims, survivors, witnesses of of crimes because you know we we uh, uh, know sometimes that that could be cumbersome to the process of. Uh, prosecuting folks, right? Um, uh, witnesses coming forward and whatnot. Um, but yeah, what what is that that plan or vision that you might have uh, to support once again victims, uh, witnesses, and uh, survivors of crime? Yeah, certainly making it a priority, adding more resources to it. And like I said, you know, my my experience in that area is, I mean, I've I've dealt with it front, you know, head on, and you know, and also making sure that people feel comfortable and coming to us in the first place. I mean, I know that, um, you know, the DA is under a little bit of controversy now. And I, I know that there have been some cases that misdemeanor cases that the DA has not chosen to prosecute. So if there's any of those that we can in the city of attorney, in the city attorney's office prosecute as misdemeanors, um, we would consider that, you know, and I've said that in other avenues before, because sometimes there are felonies that you can prosecute as misdemeanors. And sometimes it's actually easier to prosecute as misdemeanors. Um, I've had some rape cases that uh, would have been difficult to um, you know, prove in front of a jury for a lot of reasons. And so instead we stacked several misdemeanors and in that way we're able to achieve justice for the victims. Mm -hmm. So something like that. I mean, really creative thinking in, in making sure that, you know, they're, the victims and witnesses feel heard and feel like we're fighting for them. Yeah. And uh, well, we're com pretty much coming uh, down to the end here. We want to, first of all, you know, obviously, thank you for being here, for coming here, sharing a little bit of your vision, your platform here with us um, and our audience, of course. And uh, but just as we kind of wrap it up, what are some uh, closing remarks you would like to uh, leave us with? 
Well, first, you know, again, thank you so much for having me on the show. If folks want to hear more, you can go to our website. Uh, it's www.marinatorres.com. Uh, the Instagram handle, I'm bad at social media, but I, it's Torres for Los Angeles. Um, and we're actually going to have our campaign video out uh, in the next couple of days, we think. So be on the lookout for that. Um, but I w w want to just encourage people to come out and vote in June. I mean, especially if you live in the city of Los Angeles. But if you live anywhere, you should be voting. But especially in Los Angeles, you're going to be voting on all the citywide seats, the congressional seats, eight out of the city council seats are up. So you're going to have a chance, a real opportunity to change the culture of Los Angeles for the, I think, for the next generation. You know, you can create a lot of change just by showing up and having an opinion and, and educating yourself about the candidates. Uh, I will share with you, running for office is, is difficult. It's one of the hardest things that I've ever done, and I've done some hard things in my career. But, you know, what's harder is watching your city being run to the ground by inept and corrupt politicians. Um, so, I, you know, I'd love to have the support of your readers. It's, again, Marina Torres for L.A. City Attorney. Awesome. Well, thank you for that. Once again, we've had Marina Torres, candidate for L.A. City Attorney's Office here with us in the meet the Candidates 2022 series. And we'll be right back. Yo, it's Fernando. Shouts out to Valley Views, man. They played me on the station. I was like, let me make you a jingle. So this is my jingle made for this. This is what I had to do. This is Valley Views. This is what I had to do. This is Valley Views. Come and sing it like, hey, 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 I wasn't tripping when I lost my job. Nope. No reason to lie to my mom. Right. Now I've got eight, nine to five, y'all. I was like, right on, right on, right on. No work on weekends, eh? Nope. Waking up early, sleep at eight. I think I'm surely dreaming.